All right, uh, welcome everybody to our first Wednesday series. For many of you, it's not your first. For some of you, maybe your first. So uh, before I introduce the speaker and say a little bit about her, I don't like to talk much. Uh, just to give you the background, we'll have a talk um, afterwards. It'll be about 30, 35 minutes. We have a question and answer period in here with volunteers with mics so that you can ask questions. But then the, the really fun part is when we go outside and there's cocktails and conversation and you can uh, talk to each other about what you heard about and also talk to Dana about, uh, about this book and maybe some other books that she's written. So uh, I want to acknowledge our, um, our sponsors both The Courtyard and Stephen Brenda Olson. And oh, by the way, my name is Peter Kareva, and I'm the CEO and president of the aquarium, but that's not important. Um, but what's important is this is an extraordinary book, and it's really an extraordinary story. Uh, it appeals to me for a lot of reasons. Um, Dana Stoff, uh, you know, this is, it's not her, she's been interested in cephalopods, I find out, since age 10. Um, and been interested in art and writing and biology. But what's neat about this book and the time period is first of all, it's about a, an amazing woman who probably hasn't gotten much recognition. And there's a lot of women in science. Some of my favorites are Ada Lovelace for the invention of the computer, Barbara McClintock for jumping genes, won a Nobel Prize, and of course of Rosalind Franklin, who really uh, Watson and Crick wouldn't have done anything without Rosalind coming first. The other reason this is so neat is when I, you know, I've been a research biologist, when you come to an aquarium, you realize there is so much tinkering and figuring out how to keep things alive. You take it for granted when you come here and see all of our creatures alive, that is not easy. And, um, uh, and that's what we're going to hear about. And so thanks so much for braving the Southern California snow. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming here. Um, thank you, Peter, and thank you, um, Adina, who scheduled me here, and all of the AV people and tech people making it possible. And being here at this aquarium is so amazing. I love this place. Um, I actually grew up in LA, in North Hollywood. Um, and had the Aquarium of the Pacific been there, been here at the time, I don't think that my parents would ever have pried me away from it. Um, but you know, luckily for my studies and everything else that I had to do, um, the closest large aquarium that I could visit as a child was the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And that was where at age 10, I fell in love with a giant Pacific octopus and the course of my life was changed. I have never worked at an aquarium, um, but I have kept home aquariums, which have given me immense admiration and respect for all of the aquarists, many of whom may be in the audience today, who have kept these animals alive and healthy and happy um, because it is not an easy task. And I'm going to get into a little bit of that today with, uh, with Genevieve Prue Power and her octopuses. Um, but first, I wanted to meet you a little bit. Um, I don't have time for everybody to introduce themselves, so I thought I could just, by a show of hands, see how many people love octopuses. <laughs> yes, I should put mine up. Um, how many people came for the octopuses? Because you love octopuses, you wanted to learn more about them. I love it, fantastic. How many people, um, and don't feel any pressure here, came because of Jeanne Villepoux power? <laughs> A couple, you're awesome. Um, but I gotta tell you, it's totally okay if you've never even heard her name before. Most people haven't. Um, a lot of what I'm doing is kind of bringing her back um, with the help of a lot of other amazing people who have excavated her notes and her papers and started sort of this renaissance of knowledge about her. Um, and I'm hoping that by the end of my talk today, you're going to love Jen just as much as you already love octopuses. And we're gonna start by learning how to pronounce her name. Because <laughs> it's not easy for those of us who are non-native French speakers. If there are native French speakers in the audience, I apologize for what I'm about to do. You may wish to cover your eyes. But this is the best that I have been able to come up with for native English speakers to learn how to pronounce her name. Jeanne rhymes more or less with Ben, as in Ben Franklin. Veal rhymes more or less with this type of fish known as an eel. Pro rhymes with absolutely nothing and needs to be gotten over with as quickly as possible. <laughs> power is the English word power. You'll learn soon why she has an English word in her name. And so altogether, written phonetically, her name is Jeanne Villepru Power, 
and we're all going to say it together on the count of three. One, two, three. Zhen Viel Pru Pao. That was awesome. All right, I'm done. No, that, that's not it. That's the beginning. That's the beginning. Now we need to meet the woman herself, meet the lady. Um, Jeanne Villepreux Power was a Renaissance woman. She did so much with her life. And even today, I'm just going to be scratching the surface, rippling the surface, perhaps I should, sh should say. And we're going to begin with her childhood in rural France. Um, she grew up in a little town called Gillac, which is um, pretty far from the coast. It's more than 100 miles from the nearest seashore. She probably never even heard of an octopus, much less saw one. But she was very curious and interested in nature and interested in learning. And she was also fortunate to have a mother who could teach her how to read and write at a time and a place where there were no schools, and it was very unusual for a girl to be taught these things. Um, but she learned them. Um, she learned many other things. She was the oldest child in the family and took care of her younger brothers and sisters, of the livestock, of all kinds of things, until she got old enough to set out on her own. And when she was 17, little Jeanne Villepreau decided that she wanted to go to Paris, the big city, uh, expand her horizons. and. So she walked more than 200 miles to get to Paris. Now, I neglected to mention the year that Jeanne was born. It was 1794, in the middle of the French Revolution. And when she was a child, Napoleon came to power. And she had basically lived her whole life in, with her home country of France at war, with the Napoleonic Wars, um, with the Napoleon then being defeated at Waterloo and the restoration of the French monarchy. And so this is part of what Paris would have looked like when she got there. Um, but luckily, everybody kept needing ordinary things as well, like clothes, and Jeanne found work as a seamstress. She was so dedicated and so skilled at her profession that the changes in the French monarchy brought her an incredible opportunity. Um, after the defeat of Napoleon, when there was a new French king, he needed to secure his throne, which was very shaky at this time in France, by making alliances with other monarchies. And so the new French king, uh, forgive me if I'm repeating things that you remember from history class, but I slept through most of my history classes. So just in case there's anybody in the audience who did that too, I'm here for you. Um, so the new French king was arranging a marriage between his nephew, who was his, his heir to the throne, and a Sicilian princess named Maria Carolina. So he was allying the French monarchy with the monarchy of Sicily. Sicily was at the time its own nation separate from Italy. And she needed a wedding dress and Jeanne was asked to make it. She was the best dressmaker in Paris at the time, and so she was hired to make this incredible fancy wedding dress for a princess. And at the wedding, this brought her yet another opportunity because she had made the gown, she was introduced to some of the wedding party that came with Princess Maria Carolina from Sicily, because of course she didn't travel alone. She brought her entourage of well-known Sicilians, well-connected Sicilians, business people, including a merchant who was actually Irish but had been living and working in Sicily for years, a merchant named James Power. And James Power met Jeanne Villepreux, and the two of them fell in love. And the two of them decided to live in Sicily together in the city of Messina, and this became Jeanne's new home. It was a big city in some ways like Paris, but it was also in the countryside in some ways like the area that she grew up in. And she had now the means, because her husband was a wealthy merchant, and the time to explore. And what she wanted was not to continue being a seamstress, but to get to know the world around her. And we know that she loved to walk, and she walked all over the island of Sicily, collecting plants, collecting rocks and fossils. And she actually wrote a guidebook, La Sicilia, um, to four visitors to this beautiful island. And it was so thorough and remains so relevant that it was actually reprinted in 1995 this guidebook that Jeanne wrote. By the way, in Italian, which she had taught herself after moving to, to Sicily, um, she was also learning English at the time as well as Latin so that she could read a lot of the scientific literature, which was mostly, which had been written and published in Latin. People were now writing more in more vernacular languages like French and Italian and English. 
What she really loved was nature. So she was collecting all of these things, she was bringing them back, studying them, and at the time, scientists who studied the phenomena of nature went by natural historians, and this is mostly the way they did it. They took a lot of dead things and they put them in a cabinet. We call it cabinet of curiosities. Um, and there is a lot that you can learn from dead things. Um, obviously, paleontologists are pretty much constrained to studying fossils. Um, there's a lot that you can learn from studying the way bones fit together, the way the shells of animals, the way the shells of turtles work, all of this stuff. Um, preserving animals so that you can really examine their anatomy is very interesting and valuable, and Jen was really good at it. Um, this is not her cabinet of curiosities, this is a much older one, but it's sort of representative of the way natural history biology was studied at the time. And so Jen went all in. She said, if I'm gonna be preserving things, I need to create my own fixative. So she became a chemist as well, um, and she developed this this type of fixative, which is a liquid to put things in to keep them preserved uh, for basically as long as you want to preserve them. Um, and that did sometimes mean taking live animals and making them dead by putting them in the fixative. Um, and she had plans to do this at one point with a small tortoise, but she had run out of fixative. And so she took the small tortoise and she put it in a jar of alcohol, just a temporary holding tank while she made her fixative. And the next day, she found this tortoise just walking around the house. Um, and <laughs> she doesn't record in her writing how surprised she must have been. But I think that we can all assume that there was at least a little bit of surprise there. Um, I was so surprised myself when I read it that I spoke to a herpetologist, somebody who studies turtles and lizards and other reptiles, and said, really? <laughs> It was in alcohol, and I was informed that turtles are in fact gnarly, this was the technical descriptor that the herpetologist used, and can survive all kinds of things, like potentially being submerged in alcohol for a day, although please don't try this at home with your pet turtles. This is, however, how Jeanne got a pet turtle, which she named Mignon, which means cute, and apparently she would feed it, uh, it learned to come when called, she did all kinds of interesting experiments with her new pet turtle and never again tried to put it in fixative. Um, she also seems to have gotten really into studying live animals generally. Um, I think that like pretty clearly this was attractive. Like you can learn a lot from a live animal that you can't when it's been fixed and put into formalin or something like that. And so she started keeping more live animals in the house. Um, the next attempt was these animals called pine martens, which are similar to weasels or ferrets. Uh, and she collected two pine martens, brought them into her house. They are pretty vicious little animals. They do not eat kibble. Uh, she actually paid children in Messina to collect live birds for her to feed to her pine martens. And she brought a nice living tree into her house for the pine martens to climb and hunt birds on. Um, which, when you think of it as a house, is a little bit sort of maybe distressing or disconcerting, but I tend to think of Jen's house as kind of a laboratory, and then it becomes a little bit more like, oh, this was the, some of the first ecological experimentation that was ever done. Um, and then I don't think so much about the fact that the pine martens were hiding bird carcasses under the rug which is distressing again. Uh, but she did keep these two pine martens. Um, she learned a lot about how they hunt, um, and she learned a lot about their natural behaviors and how they climb and what their circadian rhythms are like, and the fact that they will steal the silverware from her neighbor if she leaves the window open. <laughs> but these were all land animals, and we have to remember that she was here in Messina on an island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, which is not only a beautiful place, but particularly off the coast of Messina, full of extra diverse animal and plant life, uh, because in the Strait of Messina, there are really interesting currents that bring up deep water animals that people might never otherwise have seen. They bring oceanic animals closer into shore, and so she wanted to do all the stuff that she'd done with the pine martens with ocean animals. How can she study what they eat, how they eat, how they hunt? Um, and so she got interested in getting animals from the fishermen. They all got to know her and knew that they should send a message to her when they found something interesting. She studied snails. These are big triton snails. She also studied uh, funny little snails called canoe bubbles that, uh, whose bodies, that's the white part, are so big that they can't actually retract all the way inside of their shells. 
um, they actually they use that big body to sort of surf on top of the water. Uh, they're a very interesting little animal. She studied these weird little shrimp called barrel shrimp. This is a shrimp with its eggs. The eggs are those little orange specks, both of them living inside of another animal, a gelatinous animal called a salp. And she studied octopuses. Here we are. Thank you all for bearing with me. We're back at the octopuses. Um, and this is a common octopus, which she studied and learned interesting things about. But the octopus, the octopus that she got really, really into and is now known for discovering things about that nobody had known before is this octopus called the Argonaut. Now, Argonauts, there's several species of them. Um, they all live inside these beautiful, coiled, delicate shells, and they are the only octopuses that do so. When you see pictures of them in the wild, they usually look like this. This is actually two Argonauts, one of them hanging on to the other. You can see the suction cups, the suckers, um, but it's hard to really identify anything else that makes it look like an octopus. So here's a diagram to make that a little bit easier. Um, this is a drawing of what an Argonaut octopus looks like when it's all spread out. And you can see that in many ways, it's a typical octopus. It's got eight arms, it's got a beak, its mouth in the middle of all of those arms. It's got a funnel or a siphon for squirting out water. And it's got its shell. And you can see the shell, the way the drawing is here, it really communicates how delicate and translucent that shell is. It's really quite thin and, uh, and fragile even. But of course, there is the elephant in the, the, the weird sheets in the room of those two large arms that are clearly different from everything else, clearly different from any other octopus. They have these big membranes on two of their arms. And it's been the most obvious thing about Argonauts in addition to the shell for as long as people have been collecting them and preserving them and sticking them in bottles. Um, and because people for so long were, collect were studying them by killing them and sticking them in bottles. Nobody knew what those arms were for, but they said, hey, they look kind of like sails. And that must mean that these are sailing octopuses. And this drawing is representative of what people thought Argonauts did for hundreds of years, that they used that delicate shell as a boat and they held their membranes up in the air to catch the wind. Uh, even though nobody had ever seen them doing this. Uh, it was pure speculation, um, but it took root so hard that even um, as late as Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, there's a scene with sailing Argonauts on the surface. Um, and this was after Jeanne's experiments that had proved they do something quite different with their arms. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want to explain how this idea of what Argonauts did actually gave them their name. So the first name that these octopuses were given was not Argonaut, it was Nautilus, because Nautilus means sailor in Greek. So this was the original Nautilus shell, um, as described in and around the Mediterranean at, in about 1600, roughly. Um, and then the Europeans who were familiar with this kind of Nautilus got to know a different kind of shell that was being found in the Indo-Pacific. Um, this kind of shell was striped, was much thicker um, and had some chambers inside it, but it's more or less the same shape. And so they said, great, another kind of Nautilus, done. Then Carl Linnaeus came along and said, no, 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 we are naming things, we are giving them specific Latin names, and we are not confusing them with each other. And so Linnaeus said, we are going to call the shell that's heavy and thick and has the tiger stripes. That one gets to keep the name Nautilus. And I'm going to give a new Latin name, Argonata, to the one that we're familiar with in the Mediterranean. And they picked that name most likely because Argonauts were the sailors on the ship Argo in the myth of Jason and the Golden Fleece. And the ship Argo, by some accounts, was the, by mythological accounts, not historical accounts, was the first ship that ever sailed in the Mediterranean. So he said, great, there they are. They're the first sailors, the Argonauts. Um, and that's what scientists began to use in their publications. But commonly speaking, both animals were still called nautiluses, and people started to add adjectives in to tell them apart. So because the shell is so different in texture and in thickness, we, started, we got the name paper nautilus for what we call argonauts, and pearly or chambered nautilus. If you're interested in chambers, talk to me later. I can talk your ear off about chambers, but we'll leave them there for now. And say that we're trying to finally get away from these 
terms, paper nautilus and chambered nautilus, so that we just have the word argonaut for the argonauts and nautilus for the nautilus. Um, and so that's, that's my little like spiel, please call them argonauts. Uh, it keeps everybody from getting too confused. But here I've been showing you just the shells, and of course there's animals inside them. And the animal inside the nautilus shell, the nautilus, is similar in some ways to the argonaut. It is in the group cephalopods that have tentacles, that have um, fairly complicated brains. It's the group that includes also squid and cuttlefish. Um, but there was a big debate because nautiluses were known to make their shells. They're born with a little shell. They grow as they grow. They're completely attached to it on the inside, just like a snail is attached to its shell and you can't pull it out. Argonauts were a little bit more of a mystery. Nobody knew if they made their own shells or not. And a lot of people thought that Argonauts might be kind of like hermit crabs and steal their shell. And they had some lines of evidence in favor of this, the first one being that octopuses don't make shells. Everybody knows that. So Argonauts don't make shells. Uh, Argonaut shell is not really shaped like its body. Its body is sort of a classic octopus lump, and its shell has a very distinctive coily shape to it. And what's more, and perhaps most compelling, the Argonaut is not attached to its shell. Instead, like a hermit crab, it can crawl in and out, and it will do so, and it does not hurt the Argonaut in any way to do so. But there were also plenty of people arguing all along that no, the Argonaut is more like a Nautilus, more like a snail that builds its own shell. Um, and their arguments in favor are that one, behold the Nautilus, a cephalopod that makes its own shell. Um, number two, nobody has ever found another animal living in an Argonaut shell. So it's different from the case of hermit crabs where we can often recognize what snail they stole their shell from because sometimes we see it with a snail inside. This never happened with Argonauts. And then finally, the most compelling line of evidence of all is that some guy one time said he saw Argonaut embryos with shells. Uh, there's no hard proof of it, um, but he published a paper where he said, I looked at the eggs and it looked like they had shells inside of their eggs, so they hatch with shells. Great. Um, so that's Poli. And so people were arguing about this, back and forth and back and forth. And Jeanne came on the scene with, now that she's learned enough languages to, f to catch up on all of the old literature, she lives in a place where it's really easy to collect Argonauts and she's fascinated by them and they're beautiful. And she writes, I perceived that lack of experience was the cause of these different opinions. Everything should be cleared up if one conducted a thorough research on this interesting point. So she's saying, guys, let's stop arguing about it. I'm going to go out and find out what they're doing. So she's going to collect Argonauts and bring them into her house and see what they do. And the tricky thing is they can't live in her house any more than they can live on the tree that the Pine Martins live on, so she has to invent something. And what she invents are the first aquariums. These were the first glass-enclosed seawater tanks for studying animals. Um, and she used them to study a lot of marine animals. They were great for starfish, they were great for snails, um, but they were not so great for octopuses. Now, do I have any aquarists in the audience? A few people. Can you confirm that of all of the animals to keep in aquariums, octopuses are maybe not the easiest? <laughs> maybe a little bit more challenging? That has been my experience just with my home aquarium. They're very sensitive. They really need the water to be clean. And then they're the ones who make it dirty because they ink in it. Um, but then they're like, no, now it's inky and terrible. Um, and so it's your job to wash out the ink and keep it clean. And fortunately, now we have filters and pumps for doing this kind of thing, but there was no electricity. Jeanne had nothing like that. And so she built something else. She created these things that, um, that they ended up calling power cages, which this is quite large. This, this contraption is almost as big as a small car, and it's something that she would actually put into the water, into the ocean, and the anchors on the bottom would hold it to the seafloor. And then she could put animals inside it, but it has slats, and so the water can be flowing through it. And so it's being naturally cleaned and filtered just from being in the ocean, 
but it's also sealed enough that the animal she puts inside will stay there, and she herself can sit in a boat on the sea surface in this beautiful shallow bay of Messina, where the water is usually very calm and very clear, and just look down, feed the Argonauts, do experiments on them, and it's time she's gonna figure out what's going on with them. So the first thing she does is break their shells to find out what they do. What does an Argonaut do with a broken shell? And it turns out they can mend their shells. They stretch those weird membrane arms over their shell, and they start to secrete new shell material. And if Jen gave them pieces of shell, they would actually take those pieces and use them like puzzle pieces and fit them into the gap and glue them in place. And she studied the chemistry of the shell and the repair job, and she found that it was all the same kind of material. So this was a pretty compelling line of evidence that they could make their own shells, but we really want that last little bit was Pulley right, do they in fact hatch with shells the same way, Argon the same way Nautiluses do? And they don't hatch with shells. So this is a baby Argonaut, very, very recently hatched. We're looking at it sort of a bit awkward, sort of from the front, you can see the suckers on its arms, you can see its eye, and what we're looking at sort of from the front on is its two big membrane arms are reaching back over its body, its mantle, and covering it. And after hatching, what happens is they do this with their arms, and their arms begin to secrete shell material. So within a few hours, there will be a tiny shell around its body underneath those arms, and shortly after that, that shell will be large enough to be visible even while the arms are covering part of it. So this is a slightly older but still quite young Argonaut. And so that was it. She'd finally, Jen, I mean, had finally put all of the pieces together, but so had some of the Argonauts, to solve the problem of whether the Argonaut makes its own shell. They are definitely not hermit crabs. They do not steal their shells. They're completely respectable octopuses. They make them themselves. They would never like to be accused of such a thing. However, they're also not snails. They're not attached to their shell. They don't make it with their, the main part of their body. Um, they are, in fact, the only animal we know of that does it with their arms. There are a lot of animals that make seashells. Um, obviously, if you've ever been out on the beach and collected sh seashells, there are shells made by snails, there are shells made by clams and mussels, there are shells made by nautiluses and all kinds of different animals. And all of those animals are using their main body, their mantle, to make the shell. The Argonaut really is different. It has evolved this totally different way of making a shell. So I like to say that they are the spider men of the shell-making world. They are shooting it out of their arms rather than anything else that anybody knows of. They are the, the superhero octopus shell-makers. Jeanne, unfortunately, did not have Spider-Man around to draw a clear analogy with, um, but she was very skilled at making her point in other ways. She was an excellent artist, and this is one of her watercolors of an Argonaut. What I really love about it is that it's in situ, in position. She always wanted to think about animals in their natural habitat. What other animals are they living with? What's around them that they're interacting with? This is, unfortunately, the only painting of Jens that we still have today. There's a whole other story about a shipwreck that I could tell. But leaving that tantalizing tidbit aside for the moment, uh, knowing that she lost a great deal of her artwork and her papers, um, she was still able to convince people of what she had done because she preserved the shells that had been mended, uh, she preserved some of the babies in their positions of creating the early shell, and she wrote and she wrote and she wrote. She wanted to make sure everybody knew that they could stop arguing about it, that the problem had been resolved, and that the lines of evidence were very clear. And this was especially difficult at a time when many scientific societies would not even allow women to come and present or become members of them to provide their information. Uh, she was the first female member of a number of societies in Italy and in Sicily, um, but the uh, big scientific society in England, the Royal Society, um, actually did not even admit any female members until 1945. This is, this is one of those things that I didn't know until I started researching this book, and then I had to cross-check it. I was like, seriously? 
<laughs> Do they mean 1845? But no, 1945. However, Jeanne was fortunate and determined enough to get a champion, a male champion, within the Royal Society, a uh, scientist named Richard Owen, who is perhaps most famous today for coining the word dinosaur, was extremely famous um, while he was alive as well, and he believed Jen, he was totally convinced by her arguments, and he promoted her research within the society and in various scientific journals. Both her research on Argonauts and her discovery of their shell making, and also her invention of aquariums, um, which she was determined to get credit for since she lived to see something called the aquarium craze sweep across Europe and North America. And this is how that happened, the history of the aquarium craze. We have Jeanne inventing her first aquariums in 1832. That was the beginning of her research on Argonauts and a number of other animals. Um, short, well, a little while after that, there was another interesting character in England um, named Anatin uh, who kept corals in an aquarium that was balanced, which meant uh, basically that she was able to keep corals and algae in a balance of producing and consuming oxygen so that the water would remain sort of filtered and fresh. Uh, which is a tricky thing to do and was something that she had to accomplish because she wanted to keep her corals in London and not have to keep sending her servants out to the seashore to bring fresh seawater back for her. She was fortunate enough to also be extremely wealthy. Um, and so we had these women sort of pioneering early techniques for keeping animals alive in glass aquaria. Uh, but it wasn't until the fish house opened at the London Zoo that the idea of being able to see ocean animals in an aquarium really took off. And this guy, Philip Henry Goss, coined the word aquarium, which is short for an aquatic vivarium when the fish house opened. And now there was a fish house that everybody could come and see, and there was a catchy name for it, and everybody wanted one in their house. Um, they wanted to come and see one. They wanted a public aquarium in their city. And Jeanne could tell that this was becoming a really big deal, and she wanted to retain credit for her invention. And so she wrote, wrote to Richard Owen, um, who had a lot of influence, and said, can you help me make sure that I still get credit for this? And in 1858, he wrote an article for or an entry in the Encyclopedia Britannica in which he credited Jen as the inventor of the aquarium. And now today, of course, we have aquariums all around the world. This is an incomplete map of public aquariums um, as of 2019. And there are also, of course, all of the aquariums in people's homes, in doctor's office waiting rooms, and in schools. Uh, and it's just, it, I think it's really exciting to see how far the, the world of aquariums has come. And of course, we have here in the corner, uh, I, I tried to put the corner of the Aquarium of the Pacific over Long Beach so that we could, we could see, but you all know where we are. Um, and I am so excited to kind of come full circle to tell the story of the history of aquariums here at an aquarium that is more or less in my hometown and, uh, and has some really amazing cephalopods in it. I'm sure that many of you have seen the giant Pacific octopus. Um, have any of you seen the flamboyant cuttlefish? Highly recommend if you have not. Um, they are tiny and adorable and just perfectly, perfectly weird little animals. Um, and they are currently babies, although I know that um, it's difficult to keep babies in baby exhibits because, as I know as a parent, babies have this unfortunate habit of not staying babies forever. Uh, they just keep getting older. But right now, there are baby flamboyant cuttlefish up there in the baby's exhibit. Um, and coincidentally, my next book is all about animal babies. Um, so uh, these are, uh, I'm closing with just pictures of my three books. The one in the middle, The Lady and the Octopus, contains all the stories that I've been telling you today about Jean Prou, plus everything about the shipwreck and a whole bunch of other fun stuff. Um, and Monarchs of the Sea is where you can go for everything about chambered cephalopods ever. It's the evolutionary history, how we got to where we are today with octopuses and cuttlefish and nautiluses from 500 million years of history of other amazing animals. And then Nursery Earth 
here is coming out in June. It's not out yet, but you can pre-order it. And it's about all kinds of babies, not just ocean babies, although there are plenty of baby squid and baby sea urchins, but there's also caterpillars, kittens, uh, condors, every kind of baby, including larval forms that you've never even heard of. And I just wanted to write about how much they all have in common and how important they all are as the ones who are really shaping the future of our planet. And with that, I just want to wrap up and open it up for some questions. Thank you all. <laughs> yes, feel free to ask about anything. Should I? I sorry, I don't know who has a microphone. Oh, hi. OK, awesome. I have a microphone. I think it works. <laughs> nice. I, first of all, thank you so much for being here. That was such an amazing uh, presentation. So you alluded to the shipwreck. Is there anything that you can tell us about it? I can. Okay, so cool. uh, what, what happened with the shipwreck is that uh, Jen and James were living in Sicily for a few years, for, for quite a few years while she was doing her research on Argonauts. Um, but Jane's work as a merchant brought them often to England. And so at one point they were moving to England, planning to, to sort of resettle there, and they decided to pack up all of their things and send all their stuff by ship, and they traveled overland, and they made it, and their stuff didn't. So it could have been even more tragic than it was, but, uh, but they pretty much lost at, like all of the experiments that she had done, and she ended up going back to Sicily later and repeating a lot of them to, to re-get all of that. Data, which is which is encouraging for those of us who've ever had a data crash um, of a more <laughs> high tech variety. I'm sure. Hi, thanks. That was great. I want to go a little bit crazy. Um, alien Con is coming up soon, and there's some ancient alien theorists who believe that octopuses are alien shape shifters just waiting to take over the Earth. I'm just kind of wondering where you stand on that. <laughs> I have a whole talk about it. I didn't bring my slides. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I can improv, though. Uh, it comes up. It comes up often. It goes back to H.G. Wells or even before that when you realize that uh, the aliens in War of the Worlds are heavily octopus-inspired. Um, we love this overlap. I think specifically between octopuses and aliens, I think more than any other animal on Earth. <laughs> um, and, and I think that it makes a lot of sense because more than any other animal on Earth, they are at once familiar and different. There are animals that are more different from us, like echinoderms. When, um, when I first took an invertebrate zoology class, my professor was like, if I had to pick an animal that was aliens, it would be echinoderms, that's sea stars and sea urchins and sea cucumbers, because everything about them is different. They have this whole water vascular system going on that's like, what, what? But they don't really have eyes that look at you. They don't have a behavior, like an octopus has a behavior, of making a home for itself and then going out on a walk to get food and coming back to its home. That's so familiar to us, and yet, you know, maybe, maybe some mammal would do that, like a, like a mouse does it too, but who cares because a mouse is like practically a human. It's a mammal and it's warm-blooded and it has bones and all of that stuff. So, so I really think they hit that sweet spot of seeming so different from us and at the same time so familiar. And that's what we want from aliens. We want something that's just wildly different from us and yet somehow relatable some, so we can have that moment of first contact. So anyway, I think that's why people always come back to this idea. Um, there's absolutely nothing in it, like, scientifically we know that I mean, I wrote a book about the evolutionary history of cephalopods. You know, I could tell you how they're related to everything else on Earth. But I, think it's, I still think it's lovely and, and wonderful that people keep coming back to it. <laughs> ah, there's, some hand, there's a hand down here. Ah, but there's also a microphone going up there, too. Let's see. Hi. OK, so the real question that needs an answer is, where did you get your dress? Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, everyone wants to know, right? You don't even know. Well, you can tell it has pockets, which is great. Thank you, yes. The suckers glow in the dark, though. 
Can you turn off the spotlight for a second and see if they glow? Maybe not. Maybe I'm not allowed to have the spotlight off. Uh, anyway, um, it's, it's a company. I, get, I should probably get kickbacks from them. It's a company called Svaha. It's spelled S-V-A-H-A. Svaha, and they make they make lot. They have one that's glow in the dark jellyfish. They have like rocket ships. They have a bunch of cool designs. Ooh, ooh, can you tell? Maybe it's not dark enough. But thank you for that. Thank you. There we go. There's a hand, and I think there's a microphone coming to you, and up there. Thank you, lights people. Hi, thank you. I, I am just curious, what size are they? That's such a good question. What size are the Argonauts, right? Yeah, I, I should put a scale bar in there. Most, so there's several species of Argonauts, and the largest ones would still sort of fit in your hand. The very largest ones are sort of about as big as a person's hand. And then there are smaller species that never get bigger than like the palm of your hand. Right up here. Yes. Arthur C. Clarke, the author and scientist, posited that if there was some animal that would take over the earth were we to disappear, it would be the octopus with the caveat that they breed and die. Is there any indication that they're evolving out of that particular roadblock? It's like I planted you. This is such a good question. They know I didn't. I didn't, but it's such a good question. It's Almost like the, the alien question, it's another one of my favorite science fiction tropes. Um, and there have been some amazing books that came out quite recently exploring what if. What if they did evolve the ability to sort of have a longer generational time and I think critically communicate between generations. Because right now, every cephalopod, every octopus or squid is born after its parents die. There's no possibility of cultural transmission there. Um, and so it's, there's always this, there's some really great explorations of what if they evolved away from that. There's not really, I can't think of any examples of cases where we've seen lifespans getting any longer. Um, I mean, I think if anything, the only examples I can think of are a few species that we know of that have actually somewhat shortened their lifespan do, do we think to sort of warmer water temperatures due to climate change, typically uh, lifespans get a little bit shorter as the temperature gets warmer. Um, the, we have the evidence of a couple of octopus cities, which you may have heard of, Octatlantis and Octopolis, where octopuses are doing something fairly unprecedented, just in the sense that we hadn't seen it before. But honestly, like there's more people in the world more people scuba diving than ever before in human history. So it's possible that these things have been happening for a while, but people just hadn't seen them. But in these, place, in these cities, there are octopuses that typically are solitary animals with their dens far apart, living in dens in fairly close aggregation. And so I think that's one of the places that scientists are looking really closely to see what's happening here. Could there be, when, when you have many of them living in an area that seems to be pretty resource rich, so they maybe aren't as stressed for food or mates, could you have a lengthening of the lifespan? But there's no, not currently any evidence of it. <laughs> <laughs> Proof that you get a PhD in biology from Stanford and not end up a boring professor like I am. <laughs> uh, it's a good example of uh, there's a lot of paths you could take as a, as a biologist. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank we'll have um, cocktails and conversation outside, and there's a restroom out there on the first floor. Uh, but before we go, I want to mention that uh, um, every first Wednesday we have uh, these events featuring biology, history books, 
and environmental issues. And the next one, we hope, the speaker has not gotten back to us to verify it, although he has confirmed, uh, is going to be a colleague of mine from UCLA, uh, Brad Schaefer, who's really probably the national expert on amphibians in the US and amphibian uh, biology. So I, I hope he will be here. Um, I'll, I'm trying to track him down, <laughs> but he's agreed to. So thanks a lot, and uh, please continue to come to our first Wednesdays. I think it really represents what the aquarium is for the community. And thank you. I mean, you're <laughs> I wish I could get a talk like that. <laughs>